So with respect to this morning's event, um, I'm sure most of you in this room know that next month we are going to mark the 20th anniversary of the handover of Hong Kong um, from Britain, from Britain to, Chinese, to China. And as we reflect on the past 20 years and look to what lies ahead, the special administrative region of Hong Kong continues to exist in what I would call a truly unique geopolitical space. Its special status is grounded in the one country, two systems approach, and Kurt has promised to describe what that actually means. We all talk about it and we use the term, but it's always good to refresh our memories. And it's played a key role in Hong Kong's success as not only a hub for international commerce and trade and a gateway to Chinese markets, but also as a rich cultural center that offers a host of opportunities to its diverse population. And the past year for Hong Kong has been particularly eventful as the special administrative region has witnessed the election of a new chief executive, Carrie Lam, some political unrest, and what we would call an evolving relationship with the mainland. The next several months are also going to be worth watching. President Xi Jinping will visit Hong Kong for the 20th anniversary celebrations. And my understanding is this will be his first visit since he, to Hong Kong since he became president. And as we look beyond the anniversary toward the 19th Party Congress in um, Beijing this fall, we will probably learn more about what lies ahead for the Hong Kong-Beijing relationship. Today, we'll hear from Ambassador um, Tang on, on these issues and others, including the challenges and opportunities that lay ahead for um, Hong Kong. And given Kurt's extensive um, experience as a foreign service officer in um, the Asia Pacific region, hopefully we're going to have time to get into some questions about the region more generally. Now, I know you all have a detailed um, bio of, Hong, of Ambassador Tong, um, so let me just make um, a few, um, let me just make a, um, share some highlights of his career. He took up this post as the Council General for Hong Kong and Macau um, last year in August, so he's been there for about 10 months, if my math is correct. Um, before that, he was a senior diplomat in um, the State Department handling economic affairs. He's also served um, as the Deputy Chief of Mission in Tokyo. He was our ambassador for APEC. He was the economic minister in Seoul. And his career also includes a stint at the White House, where he served um, at the National Security Council um, about 10 years ago. On a personal note, um, I've worked with Kurt um, for about 30 years during my government career. Um, I don't say this about everyone at the State Department, but <laughs> um, <laughs> He clearly was one of my closest colleagues um, through working um, through in all of these posts. Um, he was just a wonderful person to collaborate with. We would be on the phone all of the time on different <coughs> issues. If I had problems with state or he had problems with the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative, we could work them out. Highly respected by our Asian colleagues and really committed to advancing U.S. economic and um, overall leadership and engagement in the region. He's also been a great friend to the Asia Society. Um, we have an incredible center in Hong Kong, our largest office after the New York office, and I urge you all um, to visit there if you have not already. So that's going to conclude my introductory remarks. I know they were a little long, and you want to hear from Kurt, not me. So um, I'm just going to start now, go right into um, some questions with Kurt, um, and then we'll turn the floor open to questions in a little bit. So Kurt. Um, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, we're going to mark the 20th anniversary of the handover of Hong Kong from Britain to China. And whenever there's an anniversary, the first question always seems to be is, how would you assess those first 20 years? Um, what have been the accomplishments? What have been the challenges? Um, and what have been the biggest surprises? Great. Well, well, thank you, Wendy, and good morning, everybody. It's real. Um, enormous pleasure to be here at the Asia Society in this wonderful facility and and again today every time I've come here uh, there's always a, a, a very uh, a gathering of really really smart folks and so thank you all for coming uh, and, I, and I think we'll have a good conversation and some of the events you announced actually sound really interesting too and I'm trying to figure out whether I can change my travel plans <laughs> the um, uh, the so 
Hong Kong. And there's infinite potential, of course, for people to write songs using my last name and, and the words Hong Kong. Uh, but but it, it is a um, uh, uh, it, opening line, it's a success story. That um, on the 20th anniversary, the point that, that, that the U.S. government has been repeatedly emphasizing is on reflection, let's think about what's been accomplished under the one country, two systems framework. Um, Hong Kong continues to be a place that operates under rule of law with an independent judiciary, a clean regulatory system, um, good, a very high level of freedom of expression, um, active, uh, combative, in fact, um, free media, uh, and, and, and make, continuing to make very good uh, economic progress as well. Like, like all societies, Hong Kong has some issues and it has some limitations and it faces challenges. But, but if, if there's one thing you take home today, it's that uh, it was a good thing for uh, when, when reversion to China became inevitable for the people back in the 1980s and 1990s who prepared the One Country, Two Systems framework. It was a good thing that they did that and because it, it created this uh, unique and valuable uh, special city, which has been much more vibrant, uh, a, a better place to live, and and a uh, more successful and impactful part of the global and, and regional economy than would have been the case if that effort had not been made, uh, and and Hong Kong had just ended up as as just another city in China. Um, now, one country, two systems. You suggested that I. And I you know, sort of explain what that is. I'm, I'm, I'm not necessarily uh, the most steeped legal expert, although I've learned a lot about the basic law and one country, two systems in, in approximately a year on the job. Um, but the, 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 the idea, as you can take from the name, is that Hong Kong is part of China, but it has a separate system from China. And so as, as described in the basic law, um, all, all matters of administration and and jurisdiction and implementation and governance other than foreign affairs and defense which is reserved for the central people's government those are all um, uh, delegated if you will to Hong Kong uh, and Hong Kong has that that is enshrined in the basic law which has been ratified by by the National Congress uh, in China and it's also backed up by the, uh, the Sino-British uh, Joint Declaration of 1984, which, which set out the basic concept and has the force, the, the force of an international treaty between the United Kingdom and Hong Kong. So that, that framework is, has, has, is essential to what makes Hong Kong special, and it, it has also been the most critical element in Hong Kong's continued competitiveness, its relevance, um, and, and the freedoms and values and traditions that the Hong Kong people um, continue to enjoy. So on the 20th anniversary, that's the, that's the general reflection. There are challenges, and we can get into those, um, and, and, and shortcomings in, uh, and, and issues related to the basic law itself, which are not completely ironed out. Um, but but that, that fundamental overall picture, I think, is really important to take home. Um, I read somewhere when um, someone was describing Hong Kong that they said, in essence, this is a city of 7 million controlled by a country of 1.3 billion people. Um, how would you respond to Which that? Which number's bigger? <laughs> <laughs> the, um, you do the math. <laughs> right. The, the, um, uh, well, that's accurate, uh, except for the control part. Um, the, I'm not sure the exact population of China, and I imagine it changes every day. And seven million is a good a good estimate for Hong Kong, although it goes up and down depending on how many, how full the airplanes were, and whether the whether the rugby sevens are in town. Um, but the the uh, the uh, China is has become the world's second largest economy, a major power by any estimation, uh, a uh, an influential nation on the international stage, and certainly um, very very. Uh, um, powerful and capable of managing its own internal affairs. And then there are lots of opinions about, about the quality of that management, but, but China's 
um, internal sovereignty and, and general governance capabilities and, and capabilities as a nation are not uh, under, under question. Um, Hong Kong is smaller. Um, and so it, if there was a wrestling match, it would look about like that. So, it, which brings us back to the basic law on one country, two systems. It is that, that uh, um, promise of autonomy which, which allows Hong Kong to make its own decisions on economic strategy, on policy, on taxes, on currency, on, on education, um, on inter international affairs outside of traditional foreign affairs. For example, Hong Kong is, is a member of the WTO. It's a member of APEC. It can conclude free trade agreements, aviation agreements, um, et cetera, with, with, with uh, other countries without uh, reference to, to, uh, to Beijing. And, that, and that, um, that capability kind of evens the playing field a little bit. Not that it's a competition for power, because people of Hong Kong, for the most part, accept um, uh, Chinese sovereignty. And, uh, but, but, they, but they also greatly value the fact that they have this opportunity through the autonomy enshrined in the basic law to make their own decisions and, and set their own course for themselves. And, uh, and that's really that's a, a critical factor that makes, that makes Hong Kong both, both strong ret retroactively and, 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 uh, and um, hopefully very relevant and influential going forward. The, um, but there, but it does you, the it it um, it does create one of the risks that that I think Hong Kong faces is that, you know, for example, when Hong Kong uh, originally rejoined with China in 1997, Hong Kong's economy, remarkably enough, for seven million people, represented 15 percent of the entire PRC economy. Um, now it represents three percent. So there's still a big gap in income and capabilities. Uh, in in uh, sophistication, if you will, between the Hong Kong uh, and the mainland um, economic capabilities, but that gap that gap is, has slipped, and so when Hong Kong is no longer um, a must-have place just for the size of its of its dollar power, if you will, Hong Kong dollar power, what is the value added to the mainland when it's only three percent, or maybe perhaps a decade or two from now, only one percent? Of of uh, of the um, of the overall mainland economy it depends on relative growth rates, and but that that's not an unimaginable situation, and and the the fact of the matter is my my finding and finding of of my team and and I think most people in Hong Kong is that they there are still unique capabilities uh, that Hong Kong has because of the nature of its governance uh, and the capabilities of its people that. That makes it competitive and relevant, um, despite the the, si uh, the disparity in size. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As um, just to follow up on that, I mean, it just seems that um, as that 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 Hong Kong was always kind of the gateway to China. China's opening up to all of these other countries, and I think that's reflected in those numbers that you just provided. Does this make Hong Kong more relevant, and does it put pressure on Hong Kong to make sure it keeps competitive and ensure that its strengths as a financial hub and the types of financial services it can provide remain on the cutting edge? Absolutely, yeah. And the um, the the fact that uh, um, that China's economy has grown as much as it has creates the challenges that that of of the need to to retain com and maintain competitiveness through being able to do things that, that the mainland can't do, it also creates opportunities. So, the the degree to which Hong Kong has has served as a bridge between the Chinese economy and the rest of the global economy, what's remarkable to me is how much that has not diminished. So even though you know there's how many direct flights a day are there between New York and Shanghai? There's probably a bunch. Right, um, and there's there's a I think a half dozen or more to to Hong Kong, um, so there's it's not like uh, the old days where China was closed and only Hong Kong had any knowledge or or legal capability to be exploring the, the Chinese market and the Chinese economy didn't know how to operate globally. Um, 
but even with those changes and China's ability to work directly with other with other economies, what's remarkable to me is how much they st they still use Hong Kong. The mainland companies um, still rely upon the legal expertise and the financial sophistication of of Hong Kong, as well as some of the, the mechanical stuff that, and the and shipping and and transport continue to be a really important part of the Hong Kong economy. That that uh, service sector, including transportation, but financial services, accounting, legal services, um, uh, engineering, architecture, that that are that, that have centers of excellence in in Hong Kong makes Hong Kong really really useful. So, for example, um, it's difficult to make these calculations, but but the. It's fairly reliably calculated that 60 percent of, of China's outgoing in, uh, direct investment to the United States goes through Hong Kong. Um, it's being booked there because people in Hong Kong speak Chinese. They understand what the investor wants. They also understand what's, what's going on in the U.S. And they have the, the, the wherewithal to figure out complex financing, uh, to put together the, the legal structures that make it, that make it all work. Uh, and th and that's true for um, ingoing and outgoing investment in, and to a lesser extent trade uh, between China and the rest of the world for for other nations as well. So it, it's uh, that bridging role has not gone away. Um, it, it's actually kind of the original purpose of of economic purpose of Hong Kong when when it was first started to grow rapidly under British rule was also as a trade as a, as a free port. And, and an access point for the for the Chinese market, and there you know of course there's historical overtones to that, and and, and, and historical justice issues about why exactly did the did, did Great Britain um, feel that they could do that in the way that it did, including acquiring territory, but the economic rationale and and from the U.S. perspective, um, the kind of the overall rationale of Hong Kong has always been an economic one, and has always had a lot to do with China. I've gone on too long on this one, but but the the um, the first U.S. Consul General um, to Hong Kong arrived in 1843, a long time ago. And votes were slow then, and and his job was to sign papers uh, to get you do more than that to get huh <laughs> you do more than that uh, we have a little more <laughs> complicated operation now, and we're not and and we can't get away with taking bribes, um, but the uh, which was pretty rampant back in those days. Um, the uh, and and the unfortunate gentleman actually uh, only lasted a year because he went to Macau and contracted cholera and died. And he's still buried there in the, in, the, in the Protestant cemetery in Macau. You can go visit Thomas Waldron. Um, the uh, uh, but that that's there's a reason why Hong Kong is the oldest U.S. Dip, you know continuously functioning U.S. diplomatic post in in Asia is that economic rationale which has always been there. Um, earlier this week, I met with the, U, uh, the um, American Chamber of Commerce from Hong Kong who are in Washington, I guess, to do their annual what they call door knock when they meet with congressional people, people in the new administration. And one of their messages was that Hong Kong is a great place to, um, for business, for U.S. companies. And I thought they had a pretty diverse and also pretty strong delegation. Um, but it seems this message may be getting lost as people look more to the mainland. Um, how would you assess, um, you know, your interaction with the U.S. business community? What are they doing in Hong Kong, and um, do they feel like this is a, a, you know, remains a good place to do business? I think that U.S. business is smart, and so if Hong Kong is a is a good place for them, given what they're trying to accomplish, then they then they, you know, quote unquote, use Hong Kong, and if it and if they don't need it, it's not a cheap place to, to, to put people or to to run operations, the, then they don't. Um, uh, in net terms, there's been um, a steady, although not enormously rapid, but a steady increase in U.S. corporate presence in Hong Kong throughout the 20 years um, since the handover. And there's now by about 1,400 um, U.S. companies, um, you know, real, real ones, not like paper companies, that are, that are operating in Hong Kong, um, men, some of them are focused just on the Hong Kong market. Um, some of them, many of them, are uh, use Hong Kong as their as their China center, and and a large number of them use it all as their regional center. 
uh, one one note of concern is that the, the the ones that are using it as a regional center, even as that overall number grew up to 1,400, the number that are using it as as a regional center shrunk from about 800 to about 700. Um, it's hard to set an exact number because people have complex operations, and that's probably because of the cost of doing business um, as the main main consideration. Uh, but the uh, and 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 other cities in the region, Singapore uh, in particular, but also Taipei and and uh, and Tokyo and other places are certainly fighting for for uh, regional operation uh, head offices. Um, but uh, but that's kind of the overall picture. Um, yesterday here at the Asia <coughs> Society, we hosted um, a senior level Chinese delegation on U.S. China economic relations. And part of that program focused on um, the One Belt, One Road initiative, um, which now we're calling the Belt and Road Initiative. I just need to make that transition. BRI now, not OBOR, the Belt and Road Initiative. And um, for those of you who are not familiar with this initiative, it's basically a, a massive infrastructure and development initiative by China to work with countries to build roads and ports and, and infrastructure in, in countries um, in Eurasia and um, other um, spots in the world. Um, this, given um, you know, the, 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 just the, the amount of money they're spending on this initiative and all of the economic opportunities and commercial opportunities it, it could provide, what's Hong Kong's role in, in this initiative? Is it playing an active role? Does it have a unique position to play? Um, it wants an active role and is, is working hard to acquire one. Uh, and of course, it's it's um, sometimes difficult to define what the, exactly what that role is because it's also difficult to define exactly what the Belt and Road um, Initiative is because it has it has um, not just geographically and in terms of of, of type of pr project it has kind of fuzzy boundaries. Um, but but um, that's not I'm not that's not a criticism. It's just it's just the way it is. Um, and there's a certain inevitability to China becoming an active international investor in the infrastructure space because they've been doing so much domestic infrastructure, and and of course they have a lar they've had large um, external surpluses, and and so there, it makes sense for China to become a, uh, a net investor in the region, and of course they also have strategic reasons for doing it, and and uh, and uh, and so I do think that the Belt and Road Initiative is real. Um, I'm just saying it's sometimes hard to figure out exactly um, what it is. In that context, Hong Kong wants, you know, you know I guess in, you know, in New York terms, a piece of the action. You know, they 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 want to be involved because there's going to be deal flow, and and Hong Kong is good at making deals, at at generating and processing information, at make doing contracts, um, at arranging. Uh, complicated financing consortiums, and that sort of thing, and and Hong Kong is is excited about this prospect that there's another sort of business opportunity for for Hong Kong. The um, the and Hong Kong's been quite open about the fact, for example, you know one one um, smallish part, but but salient part of the Belt and Road Initiative is the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, um, and which. The headquarters ended up being in Beijing. Personally, I think they should have put it in Hong Kong, um, uh, but it's in Beijing. But but Hong Kong's been quite open about trying to have pieces of that bank operate in in Hong Kong in terms of the bond financing, um, maybe some of the the um, technology operations, that kind of thing. Um, but that that's just one specific example. I think there's much more greater potential for private sector activity. Um, that creates a big opportunity for us, actually, for the United States, because we have um, a good um, and clear and established business relationships and channels with financial institutions operating in Hong Kong to a greater extent, not just financial institutions, but also engineering and, and project development and, and the like, uh, to a much greater extent than we do with, with, with uh, mainland companies. and. Uh, so to the extent that decision making becomes a more diffuse, um, uh, 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 a diffuse reality under the Belt and Road Initiative, and, so, and more of that is in Hong Kong, and it's not all centered 
in Beijing or in Shanghai, there's going to be business opportunities for the U.S. And so I'm, I'm encouraging and trying to figure out um, constructive ways to, to, to catalyze this, uh, encouraging U.S. companies to, to work, make common cause with Hong Kong players um, in, in exploiting um, this opportunity, which will actually be good for the initiative itself. Because, as, as I think many of you know, um, one of the U.S. concerns about China emerging rather rapidly on, on the global financing stage is that uh, China has not been traditionally following internally the same rules for project development, transparency, procurement, um, environmental safety, um, social impact, and the like. Uh, that, that are considered you know, international standards as practiced by the World Bank or by, by the uh, Asian Development Bank. Um, and we're now like, more optimistic that the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, that one specific institution, is going to turn out better than was initially um, uh, feared. But the, uh, the, the, the broader um, concern is still there. Uh, the you know, Belt and Road, good, but needs to be good for everybody, including the people that are borrowing the money, and that they're not, they're not you know, leveraging their, their future for a white elephant. And, and I think that U.S. companies and, and financial firms together with Hong Kong entities can really help raise the quality of the overall programs. Yeah, at yesterday's event, um, China did release a white paper on the Belt and Road Initiative. It provided more information about this initiative, but I think the message still was we need to learn more. There are a lot of open questions, yeah. including in the areas that you mentioned, good governance, transparency, how these deals will be financed, and still what exactly is all of this. Right. Um, and so... And um, I think China's been honest about the fact that it doesn't have everything figured out. Yeah. Um, and and that's, that's fine. And everyone can work together to try and, mm -hmm. try and make it work well. Yeah. And I think the other message was is that they really welcome participation. And, you know, based on a number of questions and expressions by some U.S. companies and, and other analysts, um, there seems to be, a, you know, a great deal of interest in how they can tap into this initiative. Um, one of the things that surprised me as I um, read up on Hong Kong over the past 48 hours to prepare for this event is um, a domestic economic problem for Hong Kong, and that is the growing inequality in segments of their population. And that surprised me. I know other countries and other economies are facing that now, including the United States. But somehow I didn't think that would be a serious problem for Hong Kong, but it, it appears to be. Is that correct? What are the root causes? And, and what is um, Hong Kong doing to address the, um, that potentially serious problem? Yeah. That's an excellent question, and it starts to, to get at some of the issues that, that that Hong Kong fa does face in its in its own um, internal development, economic and social development. N not pointing fingers, every society's got issues. I think the the uh, income gap in the United States is something that we all are concerned about um, as well. Um, in Hong Kong, I, my my sense is that there's, if you were to pick a couple of of key factors, um, the first is the the um, uh, the both volatility, but also the the overall high price of real estate, um, and that uh, ends up generating uh, windfall wealth, um, sometimes very highly concentrated um, in the hands of developers, but also in the hands of people who can, who are sort of adjunct developers or speculators, uh, by purchasing more housing than they need personally, and and then feeding that the the market. Um, which then continues to sustain high prices, and that. Um, so I think that that the income disparity issue um, is is important. It's exacerbated by the housing thing, the housing questions. And actually, if you ask people on the street in Hong Kong, their top concern. Every every person you ask, what is the the biggest issue facing Hong Kong? It shows up in the polls as well. It's the it's the price of housing. It's extraordinarily expensive, and and, it, and it's as of right now, it's still growing rapidly, um, and that that is a, a, some guy bought a parking spot for six hundred thousand dollars this week. Um, that can get you a pretty nice house in a leafy suburb in, in Washington D.C., you know, and 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 a place to park your car and let let oil oil leak on the pavement. 
um, you know, shouldn't cost that much money. Uh, and and that you know that's an extreme example, but you know, small apartments. I mean, small by New York standards, go for millions of dollars in Hong Kong. <clears throat> so so you know, middle middle wage people or lower middle income people are facing basically an impossible um, impossibility of finding housing, uh, and the government is is working really hard to try and step in and and address that question through increasing the amount of, of housing stock that is that is um, at least instigated, if not owned and subsidized by by, by the government. Um, and and frankly, they, they, they fell behind. They got behind the curve on the government did in, in, uh, in keeping up with the, with the demand um, for space to live. And that, and that becomes, but it becomes a self-reinforcing thing because the wealth gets generated. And that shows up in the statistics. The other thing, though, and this is a little more controversial, and very sharply divided opinions on it, and so I'm not going to state my own opinion because then I'll get yelled at by somebody back in Hong Kong. But I'll say there's, there is a debate about about the you know Hong Kong shows up very high on the charts of economic freedom, and uh, and the labor contracting law. Uh, they're still debating in Hong Kong whether or not to give to require time and a half for overtime, uh, and 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 where to set the uh, the the maximum hourly number of hours that you should work in any given week, uh, and that um, that that's under active debate, and and uh, and there's a lot of dissatisfied people on both sides of that equation, and I think that's also a relevant factor in uh, in terms of of wage growth, um, particularly among lower middle income people, uh, and that that also adds to this inequality question. Is unemployment a problem? Not, but not a big problem. The unemployment rate is relatively low, um, so people can find jobs. Uh, you know, there are issues similar to the United States of, of young people, in particular, in trying to get their first job or their second job, not finding their, the kind of job that they feel qualified for, which creates frustration. Um, but generally speaking, people are able to find work. Um, in a speech earlier this year, let me just change the subject a little. You stated, quote unquote, that the principle of one country, two systems is critical to Hong Kong's success. Um, but given some of the recent political tensions with Beijing, um, including um, the disappearance of several Hong Kong booksellers, Beijing's interpretation of the basic law to prevent two pro independence legislative council members from taking their oaths, do you think the one country, two systems principle? and particularly the autonomy it provides Hong Kong is eroding. Um, how is this being viewed, and um, how do you see this playing out um, in the coming months, particularly with the new chief executive? Um, does she, she takes her oath in On July 1st. July 1st, yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I don't use the word eroding um, to describe the situation relative to this very important risk factor for, for Hong Kong. Um, but I do think that that um, the approach of Beijing toward the basic law and one country, two systems, and respect for for Hong Kong's autonomy is is an important risk for Hong Kong, uh, and and something that that bears uh, very very close watching. The because um, if you say eroding, you've concluded that 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 irreparable harm has been has been has taken place. And I, I'm, I, I'm not sure that that's the case. But I do think that, that Beijing has made mistakes um, in, um, in recent years and, um, sh and you know, hopefully is re reflecting on those or, or in, in, what, in seeing the impact of those uh, and, and, uh, and will, will not um, take steps that, that could um, in future lead to a more significant erosion of, of the of the uh, of the autonomy framework that Hong Kong operates under, the um, you, just for people in the room that might not know the specifics of these cases, the the bookseller case got more attention in the United States, I think, than the than the legal interpretation one. And in the bookseller case, five um, Hong Kong residents who published books, their job was to publish provocative um, exposés about about uh, people inside. Uh, 
mainland leaders. Um, that's not something that's popular among mainland leaders. Uh, and, and so the five of them all turned up in police custody in China. Some of them, um, it, it turns out, were probably picked up on the streets while visiting China. Uh, and some of them, uh, one was um, spirited, I think would be a good word, from, from Thailand, and, and one from Hong Kong itself, um, which is a violation of the basic law. As the basic law says in Article 22 that, that Hong Kong will not, uh, or that the mainland authorities will not execute their authority on, in Hong Kong on matters that are under the jurisdiction of, of, of Hong Kong. So just this, completely aside from the merits of the case of whether one should be uh, um, harassing or bothering or going after people for publishing um, something uh, provocative, uh, there are other ways to, if you don't like that, you could, you know, Hong Kong's got good courts. You know, people in the mainland could have sued them, right, for libel if they thought that they were publishing something that was libelous. Um, it's very different to have people just kind of uh, suddenly appear in, in, a, in a police station in, in mainland China. So that was bad, and, and it had a big impact on, on people. I don't, I don't think it was a decisive undermining or meant that the end of the one country, two systems is here, or that, that Hong Kong was, uh, was no longer a viable special administrative region. I don't think that's true at all. But I do think that's, that's not good, and, 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 uh, and the reaction in the international community I think was, was uh, useful and important in, in uh, stating that fact. The, the, um, the piece with the, the, the uh, interpretation of the basic law is a little different. And this is going to get, I'll, I'll try not to get too far in the weeds on this, but I think it's, it's indicative of, of, of some of the risks um, to, to autonomy in Hong Kong, is the um, two of the um, newly elected leg legislators in in Hong Kong, when in taking their oath, made statements that many Hong Kongers found offensive, uh, and and were not proper uh, delivery of the oath, as has now been interpreted by Hong Kong courts. So, there was a debate within the within the legislature: do we give them a second chance or not? Uh, the government chose to um, do a judicial review instead. So the case went to court. It was going through the Hong Kong courts to decide whether these these two people got another chance to, to say their oath or whether they were they were done and they'd have to have a by-election for their seats. And um, and while that was going through the Hong Kong courts, it was getting a lot of attention. People were getting riled up inside Hong Kong. The, the National People's Congress uh, Basic Law Committee um, drafted and passed a, uh, an interpretation of the basic law saying one, you know, this is, this is a, 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 a um, very, not, a, not an exact way to describe it, but, but maybe a useful way. One strike you're out kind of, um, kind of interpretation. Um, and, uh, and also defining a little more clearly what was an acceptable oath and what's not an acceptable oath. The, the problem from the perspective of, of people who are interested in, in, in the maintenance of Hong Kong autonomy is that in doing that, um, the, as, as I've stated publicly before and others have as well, uh, the, the National People's Congress preempted uh, the decision-making power of the Hong Kong judiciary to handle that issue, which in, in our view was, it was fully capable of handling. That's a view that's, that's um, agreed with by the entire um, legal establishment in, in Hong Kong. And the, the Law Society and the Bar Association both said that this was, that the, main, the National People's Congress should not be stepping in on some pending case under Hong Kong courts, because one of the fundamental parts is that of, of Hong Kong's autonomy is that the ju judiciary is independent, and can make its own decisions. Now, the, the, under the, what the National People's Congress did was not illegal, but it, that's why we called it. But it was unnecessary and preemptive, and we called it an unfortunate. You know, it's very diplomatic language. Um, but that uh, kind of thing is, is, again, not good. And so what is the impact of that? 
I think it would be an exaggeration to say that that means that Hong Kong no longer has an independent judiciary or no longer has, has rule of law. It still very much does. And, and, and there was one specific case. Um, it was a very narrow issue, oath-taking. It doesn't happen every day. It's not something that really affects that many people. Um, it's not uh, that broad an issue. However, um, if that, that kind of stepping in is is the kind of thing that that, that can um, weaken confidence in in Hong Kong's autonomy and 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 going back to my main point again that autonomy is what makes Hong Kong great and that and it also makes it Hong Kong valuable to China itself so I think China's got a real interest in making sure that that the um, uh, that the strength and capabilities of Hong Kong are maintained. With the upcoming um, Party Congress um, in China, um, will will Hong Kong issues be considered? Um, um, how will you know? Do you see any um, outcomes coming from the Congress that will affect Hong Kong? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, there may be some personnel changes. There usually are at the, uh, together with the national, uh, the Party Congress meetings. Um, the the um, to be honest, I really don't know uh, whether. Hong Kong is going to be a major topic of deliberations um, at the Party Congress. I imagine it wouldn't surprise me to see some documents issued on, on Hong Kong issues. Um, if there are, um, I would hope that they would be very, um, very strongly reinforcing of, of both parts of the one country, two systems equation, the two systems part as well as the one country part. Um, the, because um, you know, the mainland has its own concerns about Hong Kong, and it can tend to overemphasize, in my view, one country, and, and underemphasize two systems. And I think that they, it needs to be there needs to be a real it's it's a, it's a balancing act, and and it requires um, good judgment. Uh, but in order to again maintain the value of the framework, both of those elements are absolutely um, essential. Um, just one more question on this, and that would be, I mentioned in the opening remarks that um, Xi Jinping will be visiting Hong Kong. Um, what are the expectations for the visit um, with the new, um, with Carrie Lam taking office on July 1? From her perspective, what would, you know, how would she define a successful visit? Um, and from a U.S. perspective, how would you define a successful visit? Um, the, um, uh, the, as 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 it's being organized, July first is very much being set up by the Hong Kong government, and uh, in cooperation with the central government, to be a celebration, and um, and that you know given what I've already told you about how the United States views Hong Kong as a success, that's that's not that's appropriate. Um, there is a lot to celebrate, and and so that that um, there's going to be a lot of fireworks and. Dancing and 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 singing and parades and all that sort of thing. So I'm very much looking forward to that. And I am actually. It could be kind of could be kind of cool. They do really good fireworks in Hong Kong. Um, the uh, you making a pitch for people to visit? Yeah. Um, if you can get a hotel room that weekend, um, please come on over. Uh, the um, uh, and then I think there will be policy statements again, like you know, similar to your question about the the Party Congress. There may be policy statements by. By President Xi, I don't. I'm not sure whether he's completely announced that he's coming or not, but it's widely assumed that he is. Um, and and so, what exactly he says, it will be significant. And and then there will be an opportunity for Mrs. Lamb, the new chief executive, to lay out her priorities and her approach to to um, her five-year term as uh, as chief executive. And that. That's the part I'm actually most excited about. In addition to the fireworks and the food, um, is to to hear what what Carrie has to say um, about uh, about what what you know what her short term, medium term priorities are, and how and how she hopes to achieve them. Because um, she's she's been uh, she's like like all people waiting during a transition period. She's been careful not to to um, you know take take over the job before she has the job. Um, but, but, um, but she has been, you know, a, li a little more visible and vocal in the last few weeks. And I must say that what she's been saying, including in a very nice session that we had with the American Chamber of Commerce, um, in front of, um, uh, the, the, um, 
in front of journalists and, and the entire public, uh, saying very good things about what her plans are for Hong Kong and, and also um, from a U.S. perspective what her hopes are for relations with the United States. Now, that was, to, was music to my ears because it, it, um, it, I think that we have a shared interest in, in uh, policy interest in, in deepening the government-to-government -government cooperation, which is already very good, um, but, but there's always opportunities for to do more uh, and, and better. And, and um, you know, my, my real, you know, day job is to try and push forward that government-to-government -government -government cooperation and make it uh, as effective as possible, which also has the, uh, the, the benefit at the same time of strengthening Hong Kong's capabilities and also exercising Hong Kong's autonomy muscles, um, which is, is a good thing. Okay, so my last question, and then we're going to turn the floor um, op open to questions from you all. Um, you've served all over the world, mainly in Asia, but um, um, all over the world. You've worked with countries from all over the world. Um, you've been in Hong Kong 10 months. What's, what has surprised you the most? The, um, uh, that's always a hard question. But, I'm not asking what was your favorite book you read <laughs> in the past year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> People magazine, right? I mean, that's the. the uh, it's, not, it's not a book. <laughs> it's not. Um, the um, uh, well, as a, as a lifestyle matter, um, the thing that surprised me wasn't uh, the good food, the excellent cultural options, and and the and, and the fireworks and the vit, um, the visual um, uh, interesting interestingness. Is that a word? Um, uh, uh, coolness of, of Hong Kong, which makes it a major tourism attraction. But the um, is actually, uh, from a lifestyle perspective, it was how accessible um, uh, green space is. I really had no idea. So when you're a visitor to Hong Kong, um, as a as a tourist or as a business person, you never really get out and poke around. In in, in Hong Kong, actually, has a countryside um, and mountains and green space and and you know, not too far from my house, you know, people, there's wild boars and poisonous snakes and, you know, um, these hawks circling all the time, hopefully not looking for dead people or something. The, the, um, and so it's really quite wild. And that, that to, as a country boy, it, it's made the place uh, quite livable, um, even, even though it's a major Asian city, because major Asian cities can be very intense and, and, and wear you out. The uh, from a from a work perspective, I must say Hong Kong is a lot more complicated than I than I than I knew. Um, the having never lived there before, uh, the um, the politics, the the variety of economic activity, and and the um, variety of personal stories, because everyone you know, Hong Kong has a significant foreign population as well. Uh, and and then the Chinese population has arrived at different times um, and, and following different life courses. There are people that came um, way back in the 19th century, and there are people that, that came in the first part of the 20th century, and then there are people that, that fled the, the PRC in, in, during the PRC's rough years. Uh, and, and there's a whole group of, of relatively... Um, uh, um, you know, relatively well-off Hong Kongers who kind of moved all their assets and families from Shanghai to Hong Kong um, around 1949, 1950, and uh, and then and then there's a big Indian population and a big Pakistani population, and and it it actually is just very and then all of that has political <coughs> implications as well, and it makes it really really uh, fascinating to talk to people about their life stories and how they ended up. There and because um, like it's you know you could say the same thing about a U.S. city I guess because you know or certainly New York City um, where there's you know seven million how many people are there in New York these days anyone you know huh eight and, a half. eight and a half so there's eight and a half million different stories about how someone became a New Yorker I think in, to uh, to a certain extent that's true in Hong Kong as well it makes it really um, interesting and but also complicated and um, uh, that's been uh, actually, un well, sometimes 
you know, challenging, it's also been you know, delightful because it makes things really interesting. You'd be a great advocate for more tourism to Hong Kong. <laughs> I think it's a great place to, to, for tourism. And then you can go to Macau for a day. And <laughs> On that note, <laughs> um, so I'm going to open the floor up to questions. I think I'll take a few at a time. Um, when you, um, when I call on you, please identify yourself and please limit yourself to one question and try not to talk too much or too long, kind of get your question quickly so we can get to as many questions as possible. Yes. Yes. Josetta Capriati, Foreign Policy Association. Since you are the Consul General also to Macau, can you tell us a little bit what's going on over there after their own handover? And I hope you don't get cholera when you visit. <laughs> okay. Other questions? Yes. Right. Hi, Ray Burkhart. Formerly worked at U.S. Consulate uh, Hong Kong a long time ago. Um, I visit there a lot and uh, talk to some people you know also, including one woman who's on the executive council. And, um, you know, they, they talk about the same things you talked about in terms of challenges relating to how the basic law is being implemented. But they mention other things also. I mean, they talk about, uh, which, which have them somewhat worried. They talk about self-censorship in the press and how that seems to be increasingly a phenomenon. And... Uh, ownership of the newspapers and management of them sort of resulting in more of a sort of PRC line than used to be the case in the, in the press in Hong Kong. And then they also talk about, um, they worry about the judicial system. You know, they worry about uh, sort of pressures, to, I mean, you can tell me whether this is true or not, but, they, but there are pressures to drive out of the courts um, non-Chinese who, who were sort of left there in 1997 but who uh, the PRC would like to see uh, removed from the judicial system. Um, and, and other things. They, so they, they do see sort of a kind of subtle undermining. Okay, one more, please. I mean, I'm interested in your view on a very sensitive issue, namely Hong Kong's relations with Taiwan especially Taiwan's increasing tendency toward independence, and also uh, to what extent uh, the one country, two systems is a test. In other words, if it doesn't well, work well in Hong Kong, it's uh, obviously not going to be attractive to people in Taiwan. On the other hand, um, for example, the increasing isolation diplomatically of Taiwan, illustrated by the, what, two days ago, the Panamanian switch, of recognition from Taiwan to PRC, uh, to what extent that would increase Hong Kong's role uh, as a uh, more competitive than Taipei, say, uh, for financial investments. Okay, thank you. So we have three questions. I'm going to let you take them in the order you would like to. Um, well, maybe I'll uh, address Taiwan first because I. This gives me my first opportunity to duck a question. The, uh, um, the you know, with, with with apologies, I'm not the the um, I'm not responsible for Taiwan affairs, and and uh, you can ask Ray later what what he thinks. But the the um, uh, uh, it'd be really inappropriate for me to be commenting about any you know, any you know, Taiwan related issues um, from uh, um, from my position. The um, you know I think, I think Hong Kong and Taiwan have a very uh, active and, and vibrant um, relationship on multi on every possible level that you can imagine academic, um, economic, um, even political and the um, and that's that that makes um, you know makes sense they're, they're very close to each other they speak the same language and people um, uh, know it, get to know each other and and and, and, and talk with one another. The um, the the question on on um, um, raised questions on self censorship as one example of and this is, is not the first time of course I've heard people wonder about the the uh, freedom of the press or um, or censorship self censorship issues in, in the Hong Kong media 
uh, or or the um, question of of um, foreign judges um, or judges who are not you know ethnically Chinese. The um, uh, on the the judge question, the there I don't I don't think it's that big an issue because there's a smattering of of people who are not in positions of authority um, and who really don't you know there are voices saying why do we have um, and I, I hate to use like a, a word like this but not not Chinese people is sitting in judgment of Chinese people in Hong Kong. And the fact of the matter is that Hong Kong has this has a tradition, common law tradition that's very similar to British common law, Australian common law, New Zealand common law, and there are a lot of of, of uh, permanent resident judges um, and uh, who have either before um, 1997 or after joined the Hong Kong judiciary because they passed the the qualifications in order to do so. So Hong Kong has allows anyone to become a judge who is is qualified to be a judge um, under under Hong Kong um, statutes and you know I, I think for the vast majority of, of Hong Kongers they're perfectly fine with that and the judgments don't there's no I, I haven't heard of anyone uh, demonstrating that there's any substantive difference in the judgments um, of, of the ju judges regardless of whether their last name is Smith or or Tong, <laughs> um, the uh, the, um, and and I think Hong Kongers are fine with that, and it's kind of to me it's sort of a red herring of an issue, and I don't expect there to be a problem with that. The 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 self censorship question, um, you know, I think things are are it's important to think about why people worry about self censorship, and and when people worry about it, generally they're saying ah, a, a mainland person has bought that newspaper. It was formerly owned by, by a, a Hong Kong person, and so now the editorial line might change. The, now, <clears throat> there it's difficult for me to assess that, um, both because there there's a timeline in question and issues change and opinions change over time, and also there there's a question of what you know what is the, what was the baseline for that change? How would you measure it, etc. Um, and the um, and and it's kind of it's it's really hard to to pin down because the uh, you know people often point to the South China Morning Post and the South China Morning Post I think has been very public in saying that that they want to do more China coverage um, but but they but they're going to continue to have a very independent and freewheeling and editorial line and if you look at their pages they have editorials that are kind of pro pro Beijing and they have editorials that are anti Beijing and Sometimes I disagree with both, and 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 the um, so it's hard to to pin down. But but I do think it's an area for concern, and those that are most concerned with it are journalists themselves. And what what I've seen, which I find very encouraging, is is that given modern technology, journalists who are worried about about freedom of expression and finding a channel for expression of their either journalistic reporting or their editorial opinions have um, been very active in utilizing um, various forms of funding to stand up new non-traditional media. And so the, the, the most freewheeling part of the Hong Kong media is online. And then, and then the um, printed part, I think, is, is, is um, I think, partly because the cost of paper um, tends to, you don't see the, quite the wide range and and dramatic language that you see online, um, but but overall, it feels like if if someone has something to say, um, or or they want to, uh, as an enterprise, do journalism, there's still um, good opportunities to do that. But I'm not. But I'm not. I'm not. I'm trying. You can you can tell. I'm being trying to be careful. They're not saying that there's no problem at all. But uh, but again, I don't. I don't think it's it's useful to exaggerate. The, the problem yet. It's just one of those things that bears that bears um, watching. And of course, we have issues in the United States, as you might have heard about um, about uh, how our media works. Um, and we don't have to get into that. But the the um, you know, certainly there's a lot of debate in the U.S. about the relationship between money and journalism, and 
academia and ideas and, and how those should all um, and real and fake news and and well you, you said it <laughs> not me um, the uh, um, Macau is um, well can you just explain what, yeah, I, right. I, did, yeah, yeah. I mean what's your position vis-a-vis -vis Macau because I didn't make that clear oh, I'm sorry so I, I am the US Consul General uh, to Hong Kong and Macau yeah um, we don't have a physical. So thank you for your question because we didn't yeah. put any <laughs> right. yeah. so, focus on Macau. Um, and Macau is not coming up on its 20th anniversary that, yet. That will be in, in um, 2019. And I imagine at that time there will be more um, focus on Macau. But I'm happy to, to, to discuss it briefly. Um, Macau is, is about one-tenth the size of Hong Kong. Um, its economic um, system and, and diversity is is considerably less. It's it's very wealthy, uh, and and I think generally also a very successful place. Um, it 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 feels and looks different uh, than Hong Kong, um, uh, and and kind of has its own traditions and, and, and set of rules. Even though the fundamental legal framework for, uh, is is quite similar. So the basic law in Macau. The basic law for Hong Kong is written first, and it's kind of clear that 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 basic law was then said, okay, let's use this for Macau too, and and Portugal and and China were 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 okay with that, and the, and um, but politically it, it kind of it has a different flavor, and and it it's it's a a different um, kind of place. Art, one of our from the U.S. perspective. Um, the United States, uh, um, and I think you, you probably all know that gaming is is the top industry in Macau. Um, gaming and tourism associated with gaming, and and Macau really wants to have, in order to make that more stable, wants to diversify from just tourism associated with gaming to tourism in general, and 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 also um, other services industries there's really very very little space there's no room for manufacturing or for or for any of that um, but but um, but I think there's interest in, in in further development of real estate and things like that in Macau and so our, our conversation with Macau um, has often been about ways that we can have a wider variety of US companies we have a few very large US companies that have invested a lot of money in the gaming industry in Macau quite successfully um, and and that's that's interesting and it's good for Macau, um, but but my hope is that we can get um, a, a wider variety of Americans involved in in, uh, in cooperation with Macau uh, going forward. And what types of companies? Well, you know, um, restaurants, um, agricultural suppliers, wine distributors, um, tourism companies, entertainment. There's there's great entertainment facilities um, in. In uh, in Macau that have been built in conjunction with the with the uh, the um, the tourism uh, infrastructure, and and uh, but then getting the, the acts there. I mean, I think I think Macau has real potential to be a place where um, people actually make and put on movies and plays um, in cultural space, in, in and involving you know U.S. Money and ideas and people, um, in 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 useful ways and and um, and you know, hopefully by having uh, a more sort of cultural types from the United States uh, hook up with people in Macau, we could we could exploit some of those opportunities because the facilities are there, and the, and the the what's the term for it the the throughput of people in Macau is quite high. They have 30 million visitors a year, um, and so that's a, a lot of. People that you know, when they're when they're not at the gaming table, might want to go see the cats. Is cats still running in New York, or did it finally stop? Hamilton. Hamilton. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. Yeah, you know, people in people in Macau could actually afford a ticket at Hamilton. Um, <laughs> but could they get one? <laughs> um, other questions. And please introduce yourselves. Yes, I'm Peggy Blumenthal from the Institute of International Education. Hi. Hi. And um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the higher education sector uh, as one that also is sort of uh, people are worried uh, it's maybe too soon to worry but people are starting to worry about uh, the independence of um, Hong Kong's higher education system uh, particularly because it was such a useful um, uh, 
kind of bridge for American scholars interested in China, and now increasingly a lot of Chinese PRC students coming to Hong Kong. But as the Communist Party and the Chinese government seem to be cracking down on universities in China, is do you see any um, ripple effect in Hong Kong? Um, this is another one of these questions where I'm going to say that things are okay for right now, um, but they're you know I'm I'm not as as read in on all of the various. Um, you know, there have been a couple of personnel controversies at, at, at Hong Kong universities about why did that person not get that job? Was it because of their political views? Um, and um, I, I can't speak to that because I, really, I honestly don't know. Um, can't not capable of making a conclusion. Um, so there is the people talk about that as a concern. I, I again look at it primarily as an opportunity. Um, you know, Hong Kong has has uh, you know eight or nine you know, city-mandated um, major universities and a, and a whole plethora of, of smaller academic institutions um, and, and, a, and a whole lot of private schools at the, at the secondary level and primary level that are also um, capable of making their own decisions and doing interesting things. And, and my hope is to, is to and, and Mrs. Lamb is actually pushing us, the United States, to uh, push U.S. universities to think more about how they can partner with Hong Kong universities. I mean, we can do it in the secondary education level as well, but, but tertiary, I think, is a particular opportunity because these schools are, are good, they're well-run, they're, they're capable, they're, they show up you know, in good spots on the global rankings, and, um, uh, and, and they're open to international students. The, um, uh, the like mainland or like U.S. universities, there's a lot of mainland students that want to study in, in Hong Kong, and of course it's closer, and they can study in Chinese, and so there's even more demand for mainland students to study in Hong Kong than there is in the United States, if you can believe it, where we have, I don't know how many, hundreds of thousands of, 320,000 mainland students in the U.S. now. Um, so the, uh, um, that, that's more than in Hong Kong, because Hong Kong's smaller. But the, uh, the, at the undergraduate level, the universities are careful not to have the number of mainland students swamp, swamp the opportunities. Um, and, at the, and at the graduate level, I think kind of on the other foot, um, the, the Hong Kong universities are looking for um, more Hong Kong students to actually do the graduate work in Hong Kong and not run off to the United States for their graduate work. And they want more U U.S. or European or Japanese or Australian or, or Southeast Asian, Korean um, uh, students to come to Hong Kong for graduate work. And some of the universities have been quite successful with that, and some are still struggling with it. And uh, and I think we could really step up our work on that. And it would it would be it's a it's it's a complete win 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 for everybody involved to have. Um, universities be more uh, internationalized in mul multiple directions, right? Not just like lots of people coming to the U.S. to study, but lots of people going from the U.S. to study or Europe or China. And Hong Kong could be a, a, a really nice piece of that. Which brings me to, to a Hong Kong-related issue uh, where I think Hong Kong needs uh, particular work is in the tech sector. Um, the They have uh, a couple of, of of really good um, uh, technological universities, engineering schools, but but there's a there's a need for more of that in Hong Kong, just as a competitive pro matter. Um, there's the um, Hong Kong could use a few more engineers. I'm not saying it has too many lawyers. It's the usual joke about the United States. Um, too many bankers. Uh, bankers or real estate developers. Um, the um, but it could use some more engineers, particularly in emerging technologies, um, because I think Hong Kong could usefully have its services sector and global technology be more closely knit. So because some of the, the emerging services products are kind of indistinguishable between a technology and a service. And, and if you were to generalize, this is a generalization, but Hong Kong is not as competitive in that area as, as some other um, some other cities in in, uh, in Asia, and certainly not, you know, the U.S. is the best, or the best at everything, right? Um, but um, the um, 
that Hong Kong's trying to catch up. Other questions? Yes. Hi, uh, Willa Thompson, lowly NYU graduate student. Um, I was wondering, given the unique nature of Hong Kong's autonomy, what is the Hong Kong government's perspective on tensions between the United States and China in the South China Sea? Yeah. Okay. Before okay. That, let's take mm -hmm. a few. Other, any other? Yeah, please. Hi, Wen Zhe Zhao from Credit Suisse. Um, it sounds like there are more uncertainties about Hong Kong in the future. Um, so I want to ask what can prevent um, the mainland to undermine, to undermine uh, more of the basic law? Uh, is that international pressure or is that internal um, pressures from Hong Kong people? Okay. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, Robert Laidley, a long time member of the Asia Society, and you do a beautiful job in bringing issues like this forward. This is in connection with the previous question. Um, the Chinese military, who seem to act somewhat independently of uh, Beijing, are playing a very dangerous game in the South China Sea. And uh, it, on a number of occasions, they're getting very close to a military confrontation. And if that happens, we've got a mess. We could have set ourselves up as enemies. And, well, we want to avoid it. The obvious way, we need to have an agreement with China. Because even though we have major differences, we want to be on speaking terms so that where there are possibilities to do something to mutual advantage, that'll still be open. The obvious way to do this seems to be to have a joint agreement uh, to um, uh, agree to jointly uh, attack ISIS wherever possible. I understand we're very close to an agreement on that. And um, that would seem to be the obvious thing to try to forward. And I believe that the Senate committee responsible for taking this forward, one way of doing it, is the Armed Services Committee under Senator McCain. <coughs> so the thought is, do, what do you think about this possibility? And um, what might the Asia Society do if you agree with the need to do it? What, how could the Asia Society become involved? Maybe I can, <clears throat> let me just start on that question and just to, um, remind everyone that coming out of the Mar-a-Lago summit between Presidents Trump and Xi Jinping, um, they set up um, pillars for engagement, both on economic issues but also on political and security issues. And my understanding is with respect to the political and security issues, um, they will be meeting, the first meeting will be held shortly, where I'm sure they will be discussing um, a lot of the issues um, that you have mentioned. Um, with respect to the Asia Society's role, I mean, first of all, thank you very much. I always love to hear about people who, who I'm, I'm new to the Asia Society. I've only um, been working with um, the Policy Institute for a year and a half, but I know there are a lot of long-term supporters and people who come to our programs and ask excellent questions. And um, we view ourselves as a bridge, um, and, and um, particularly in the Policy Institute, we like to view ourselves as um, you know, um, um, an organization that can convene different views and try and um, broker some recommended policy solutions. So um, in, in the South China Sea area, for example, we have done some events, but it's an area we're looking into to see what we can um, contribute. Um, Kurt, maybe I can then turn to you. I don't know what more you want to say about the South China Sea or if the U.S. Um, cooperation with Hong Kong can play a role um, in that regard, um, and um, um, I know there was another question: Would would international or, or um, pressure help at all in keeping um, you know the basic law more intact? Let's say. Right. Right. <coughs> um, the just as a general proposition, people in Hong Kong um, follow U.S.-China relations closely, 
and care about it because they understand that as as a city that 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 provides <clears throat> bridging services, if you will, between the U.S. And, and, and Chinese economies, but also between U.S. and Chinese societies, the um, the, the overall tenor and direction of the U.S.-China relationship can have an impact on Hong Kong. And certainly um, the people of Hong Kong d would not uh, like to see increasing tensions in the South China Sea, um, and they would like to see um, things be, uh, you know, amicably handled. The um, That, of course, is the stated intention of China as well as the United States. So I'm not going to recite. I, I know the talking points for the South China Sea, but it's not my job to, to recite them again um, today. But I think that um, um, the um, uh, the you know the question of, of is it relevant for Hong Kong? You know, Hong Kong is on the, the South China Sea. You can see the South China Sea from my from my bedroom window. The um, so. So yeah, naturally Hong Kong is observing it and watching it, thinking about it. Um, they're not necessarily a player in in that issue, but they, but they think about it. On the question, I thought the 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 very good question about what 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 can be done uh, to uh, help make sure that there isn't significant erosion of, of Hong Kong's autonomy. And 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 what is the what is the right approach to this? I think that's a, I think it's an excellent question, and and there are various aspects, and you you actually mentioned some of them. That um, the uh, it, reminding um, Beijing authorities of the promise promises made in in the in the Basic Law, um, in the Joint Direct Declaration. Um, and in and, and the overall one country, two systems framework, I think is, is important. And lots of people can do that. Um, when, when I do that, uh, we get a complaint from the main, mainland government. But we do it anyways, right? Because the United States has a legitimate stake in Hong Kong's future. And so I think, I think the United States has both a right and a duty to say, um, to Chinese authorities, you know, respectfully, but but you know, clearly that that we think that that those promises are important, um, and that gets to the question of international pressure. What form of inter international pressure is is the most effective and the most appropriate? There are lots of opinions on that. We don't have to get into that in detail, but I think that the international community has 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 a voice, and the international community can use that voice um, to to. Um, suggest to China that, that it's really important that Hong Kong continue to be uh, made viable um, by by respecting its autonomy. <clears throat> the, the you mentioned the Hong Kong people. I think the Hong Kong people have a voice. They've shown that voice um, from time to time uh, over the years in, in various ways. Sometimes through protests, um, but but more frequently. Um, and I think continually in conversations. There's a lot of I mean, Hong Kong's, it's not only part of China, it's right next to China as well. And there are lots and lots of Hong Kong people and mainland people talking to each other every day. And many of them are very influential people. And people in Hong Kong, I think, do and, and, and will continue to say to mainland friends and business partners and colleagues, hey, this is what makes us tick. Um, let's, let's keep it going. Let's, let's, not, let's not mess with success. Um, let's keep it going, and and then which gets me to, to the main point is I think that 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 um, you know China need needs it, it finds some things about Hong Kong irritating because uh, you can't demonstrate freely inside China or say what you want on the internet or in the media, um, and you can in Hong Kong, and Hong Kong's part of China, so people in main in mainland authority types are. Like, how come they're doing that? Why, why, why do we let them keep doing that? But and and the right, I think the best answer to that is because it is in China's self-interest, both as a matter of of keeping its promises, but also as a as a bottom line question for Hong Kong to continue to be a viable 
um, autonomous en entity going forward. And you know, of course, non non mainland people telling mainland people what's in their interest. They they might not they might not um, say, oh yeah, I didn't think of that. You're right. We should we should we should uh, let Hong Kong be Hong Kong. Um, but but then you know I think of in 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 the in the interstices of, of of human contact, those conversations have an impact on on on, on people's thinking in 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 uh, inside China and and people in in Beijing can and 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 I hopefully hopefully will continue to say hey this is this is great let's 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 keep it going. Okay, and with that, um, we're going to close this event. Um, Kurt, I want to thank you so much for your candid and thoughtful responses, in some cases diplomatic, but in most cases pretty candid. Um, <laughs> um, I also just want to just highlight for everyone here, Kurt's had an amazing career in the Foreign Service. It's continuing. He's, he's worked for our country for over 30 years in diplomatic service. You can tell by his thoughtful responses that he really cares and he really wants to um, advance the U.S. role in the world in the Asia-Pacific region. And um, I think we are just lucky and fortunate to have people like Kurt working for the U.S. government and representing our country abroad. So with that, I'd like to close the event. And please, let's give Kurt a round of applause.